In the early hours of December 8th, 1941, Japanese air and sea forces began their invasion of British Malaya. It was the start of a two-month campaign that would culminate in the fall of Singapore and the destruction of Britain's position in the Far East. By December 1941, the British had been preparing for a Japanese attack on Malaya for some time. They were keen to hold on to Singapore as a base for naval force in the Far East, and that meant that Malaya itself needed to be defended. After all, if Japanese troops reached the Straits of Johor and could bring down artillery onto the naval base, then Singapore would be rendered useless, regardless of whether or not it could be held by ground forces. So plans were drawn up to hold Malaya against any hostile incursions. Lieutenant General Arthur Percival, commanding ground forces in Malaya, estimated that he would need around 48 infantry battalions to securely hold the peninsula. But by December 1941, only around 30 battalions were available. These were split among three different field divisions and garrisons spread around Malaya. The British force represented a mix of troops from all across the empire. Many had only recently arrived in Malaya and had little time to train together, let alone in specialised jungle fighting. Many Indian battalions in particular were fresh recruits, some of which had actually been trained in desert warfare in expectation of service in the Middle East. Though there was plenty of artillery and anti-tank weapons, there was a lack of communications personnel and absolutely no armour. The defenders were understrength, undertrained, and under-equipped. The contrast to the Japanese invasion troops could not have been more stark. Under the command of Lieutenant General Yamashita Tomoyuki, the 25th Army would land two divisions in northern Malaya and drive a third through Siam to the north. Its troops were trained for amphibious operations, well motorised and armoured, and had significant combat experience from fighting in China. The invasion would be supported by aircraft from 3rd Air Division as well as support from the Japanese Navy. Both sides thought that the battle for the air over northern Malaya would be crucial to the outcome of the campaign. To that end, the RAF built a variety of airfields in the north of the peninsula, designed to extend its range over the sea as far as possible. It was estimated by those in Malaya that a force of 566 aircraft would be needed for a successful defence. Those in London disagreed and forecast a need for only 336. So naturally, the amount actually in Malaya in December 1941 was 215 aircraft. The situation was even worse when you consider the aircraft the RAF did possess were mostly those considered obsolete or unsuitable for deployment in other theatres. The British fighter force in Malaya was made up of the US-built Buffalo fighter. It was slow, unmanoeuvrable and inferior to Japanese fighters on both land and sea. The aggressive positions the RAF had chosen for its airfields created a challenge for the army. It forced ground forces to hold a very advanced front line to protect them, even if this meant spreading themselves thinly across a wide area. The task of holding Northern Malaya fell to the Indian Third Corps, with its two divisions and around 30,000 troops. The Australian 8th Infantry Division was stationed in Johor to guard against Japanese landings, while two more brigades were retained in Singapore itself. Of the Third Corps' five operational brigades, four were on the front line. The strongest unit, 11th Division, was positioned to defend Malaya's northern border with Siam. It had one of its three brigades in reserve to shore up any breaches. Meanwhile, the 9th Indian Division held the east coast, protecting airfields at Kota Baru and Kuantan, but had only two brigades, so no reserves available. Neither division was in a position to support the other during an invasion. On December 4th, a Japanese convoy of 19 ships set off on its journey to Malaya. An Australian reconnaissance plane reported the armada south of Cape Cambodia on December 6th. As soon as this happened, the key decision for the senior British officers in Malaya became whether or not to launch Operation Matador. 
Matador was a plan for a preemptive strike into Thailand to seize key ports and prevent a Japanese invasion from coming ashore in the first place. Denying these ports to Japan would mean that enemy supply lines would have to run south all the way from Bangkok, massively hindering the invasion of Malaya. Originally conceived as a bold and decisive forward move, by December 1941 Matador had been slimmed down on account of the low number of troops available. Troops from 11th Indian Division would still advance to and secure Singora, but a Japanese landing at Patani would be permitted. Two Indian battalions and a battery of Malay artillery would be ordered to hold the Japanese instead at an easily defensible position 30 miles inside Thailand, known as the Ledge. This smaller operation was termed Krokol. Matador had been controversial, as a preemptive attack against a neutral nation like Thailand might make Britain look like the aggressor and make it harder to secure US support. It took until December 5th for authorization to trigger it to be given. The Commander-in-Chief Far East, Air Chief Marshal Robert Brooke Popham, would be responsible for triggering it, but could only do so if Japan attacked Allied possessions in the Far East or to forestall a Japanese landing or as a reply to a violation of any other part of Siamese territory. The wording of Brooke Popham's orders was such that in his view it effectively put him in charge of declaring war on Japan. So he wanted to be absolutely sure that a Japanese invasion really was imminent before ordering Matador's execution. So when information about Japanese convoys being sighted at sea reached Brook Popham at 2pm on December 6th, he held off until their intention was more certain. He didn't want to fall for a Japanese bluff. The Indian 3rd Corps, responsible for holding Northern Malaya and carrying out Matador, was ordered to the highest degree of alert. This order found the commander of the 3rd Corps, General Sir Lewis Heath, in conference with General Arthur Percival, the overall commander of British ground forces in Malaya. Heath was deeply sceptical of Matador, viewing it as very unlikely to succeed considering the large distance that needed to be covered to Singora by British troops. Time would be of the essence, so Brooke Popham's hesitation to give the order made Matador even more difficult as the hours ticked by. The following day, weather over the sea was poor, and the Japanese fleet managed to avoid detection until 7pm, a full 30 hours after the original sighting. By this time, the fleet was just 70 miles off Singora, steaming south at speed. It would be too late to launch Matador now with the expectation of taking the port, since the Japanese would beat them to Singora even if the British left immediately. General Percival advised Brooke Popham that Matador should now be cancelled, but the British Commander-in-Chief hesitated, not wanting to dispense with his only offensive option at this early stage. At 10.30pm, the Indian 3rd Corps was ordered not to begin Matador, but to keep troops in position ready to launch it at any moment if ordered. According to the historian Peter Thompson, this was essentially the worst of both worlds. The 11th Division would now have to remain in their four positions near the Thai border, on alert, in the pouring monsoon rains, all night. And every minute spent stationary was another minute that wasn't being invested in strengthening defences further south at Jitra, which had been identified as the best position to hold a Japanese advance north of the airfield at Alor Star. The night dragged on, with British commanders nervously awaiting news of Japanese attacks uncertain of the exact whereabouts of their opponents. At quarter to one in the morning, they got their answer. The first blows of the Malayan campaign were not struck in Thailand, but on the beaches of Kota Baru, on the northeastern coast of Malaya. The invasion began with a detachment under Major General Hiroshi Takumi from the Japanese 18th Division. It was a force of a little over 5,000 men made up of the 56th Infantry Regiment with supporting batteries of anti-air guns and artillery. The invaders were quickly met by fierce resistance from 8th Indian Brigade under Brigadier Berthold Key. Dug in along a 10-mile stretch of beach was a single Indian battalion which inflicted heavy casualties amongst the first Japanese wave. However, they could not prevent a few landing craft from using the interconnected waterways of the marshy ground to get behind the front line launching attacks from the rear that destabilised the Indian defence. A Japanese foothold was established by 1am. 
Less than two miles inland from the battle was the local RAF airfield, which from 2am launched air attacks with aircraft from No. 1 Squadron, Royal Australian Air Force. Fierce anti-air fire lit up the sky as the pilots flying Lockheed Hudson bombers mounted successful raids on the transports carrying Takumi's men. Two ships were damaged and a third sunk. It was a welcome victory, but the fighting on the beach remained as intense as ever. After four hours of fighting by 3.45am, the defenders had mostly been displaced from the beach, which meant that the airfield was already under threat of capture, being so close to the coast. Recognising this and keen to repel the invasion on the beach, after dawn Brigadier Key ordered a counter-attack with his reserves. Two Indian battalions were brought up to attack the beachhead from north and south. Throughout the day, tough fighting raged on the coast, but slowly the Japanese began to get the upper hand, aided by large air attacks. The fighting got closer to the airfield, and when a rumour went round that the Japanese had broken through, somebody on the base, whose identity has remained a mystery, ordered without authorization that a scorched earth policy go into action. Buildings and fuel dumps were set ablaze, and by the time Brigadier Key and the RAF commander, Wing Commander C.H. Noble, could confirm the rumour was false, it was too late. Additional Japanese reinforcements arrived on the beach from 7pm, and the position at the coast became untenable, prompting a retreat to the town of Kotobaru itself, a little way inland. By the end of the following day, 8th Brigade had pulled back further. A Japanese foothold in eastern Malaya had been achieved, for the loss of 320 troops killed and 528 wounded. Indian and British losses had been 68 killed, 360 wounded, and 37 missing. Following the loss of Kota Baru, the commander of the Indian Third Corps, General Sir Lewis Heath, advocated for a much more substantial retreat, with 8th Brigade withdrawing inland to Kuala Lipis. This would surrender a large part of northeastern Malaya to Japan, but it would enable the brigade to redeploy via the rail network to the west coast effectively. This plan was initially blocked by General Percival, who was horrified at the idea of surrendering such a large area to the Japanese so soon after the invasion. Soon though, a rapidly deteriorating situation in the west of Malaya would leave the British no choice. In the next episode, we'll turn our focus here, looking at one of the Japanese army's most significant early victories at the Battle of Jitra.